Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from your UPSC perspective. So far, you all are well aware about the e-learn platform of Rouse IS 30 Circle as it encompasses all your needs with respect to your preparation for civil services examination. So far, through this platform, we have provided you various materials which can be handy not only for your preparation but also for your last time revision. The eLearn platform is a communication link between the Rouse IA study circle and civil services as well. So, you can ask your specific queries related to any materials, courses, videos, questions or even any subjects related to UPSC examination. So, we would suggest you to keep yourself updated through our feed wall. As through the feed wall, you can keep yourself updated for any new posts from our side. And please keep sending your queries related to your UPSC preparation with respect to any subject, material, videos which we have provided you on the eLearn platform. Now so far we have uploaded various subject wise DNS quiz which has been discussed in different DNS videos from the past one year specifically from May 2019 to March 2020. Further you can also take up the current affairs quiz with respect to your focus magazine. As you can see, it provides for quizzes for different months. So all you can do is to take a quiz for any particular month. As these quizzes will help you to revise and retain important topics of that particular month. As questions may be asked by UPSC with respect to any important happenings of any particular month. So in this regard, keep yourself updated through this e-learn platform of Rao's IA study circle. So with this announcement, let's move on to our news discussion for the day. So these are the important news to be discussed today that is on 18th April 2020 with respect to the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper. So let's start our today's discussion with these important topics. Now our first discussion for the day is with respect to the RBI move which has been covered throughout the newspaper which you can see. Now this news appears on page number 1. It says RBI to pump in rupees 1 lakh crore. And this is with respect to the fact that more funds are required for NBFCs, NABARD as well as SIDBI. So with respect to this decision of RBI to infuse more funds, an editorial also appears on page number 6. It says, helping a lending hand in the time of crisis. The RBI has made life easier for banks. It has given the government the cue for a fiscal support plan. Now this editorial has highlighted various important aspects with respect to the move of RBI which we shall discuss in detail. Moving on from the editorial, we come to the business section on page number 15. Now on this page, three important news appears. First, NBFCs get rupees 50,000 crore liquidity booster which is in continuation of news on page number 1. It says, banks to get funding via targeted long term repo operation invest in CP and CDs bonds of these entities. The next news says moratorium period will not count for NPA purpose RBI. And the last news says that industry hails RBI move. It highlights that the steps will boost liquidity and also benefit NBFCs and MSMEs. So in this regard, let us go through the important highlights of the decision taken by RBI in order to improve liquidity in the market. But first of all, let us also go through the earlier steps taken by the Reserve Bank of India as some of the steps taken yesterday by the Reserve Bank of India is in continuation of the steps taken earlier. So in this regard, let us go through some of the important news which we had discussed in the early DNS videos dated 28th March 2020 and 2nd April 2020. So in the first part of the discussion, let us understand about RBI's latest decision with respect to targeted LTRO, ways and means advances, as well as liquidity coverage ratio. Now as you can see that the first step taken by RBI was discussed also in detail on 28th March 2020. The news highlighted that RBI cuts rates allows loan moratorium and similarly an editorial also appeared and also news appeared in the business section whereby it read home and auto EMI's credit card dues deferred by three months and liquidity floodgates opened. Now in this news we discussed that because of the COVID-19 outbreak, the RBI had taken certain steps in order to ease out liquidity in the market. It said that RBI had unleashed a form of economic measures to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 virus. And these actions taken by RBI were with respect to rescheduling of payments of term loans and working capital loans, 
reduction in repo rate and widening of monetary policy corridor measures to enhance liquidity by around rupees 3.7 lakh crores and also deferment of last tranche of capital conservation buffer and through these measures the rbi tried to inject liquidity into the financial system of india as the financial system of india is coping badly because of the covid-19 virus further we also discussed about a moratorium of 3 months on payments of installments of all term loans which are outstanding as on march 1st 2020 so here rbi has given a grace period of 3 months from 1st march to 31st may 2020 with respect to payments of emis or installments of any loan taken by companies or individuals however such decision was left to the scheduled commercial banks further the news also highlighted that if any emi is not paid within this period then it shall not be counted for the purpose of non performing asset so these decisions have already been taken by the reserve bank of india further the rbi also reduced repo rate and also widened the monetary policy corridor that is the rate between marginal standing facility and reverse repo rate and the rbi also reduced the repo rate by 75 basis points from 5.15% to 4.4% whereas the reverse repo rate was reduced by 90 basis points from 4.9 to 4% further even the marginal standing facility was reduced by 75 basis points to 4.65% so these steps have already been taken by the reserve bank of india in order to ease liquidity in the market So under targeted long term repo operations RBI decided to inject rupees 1 lakh crore into the economy through these targeted long term repo operations and the injection of fund through targeted long term repo operation was for a tenure or a period of 3 years now after this decision of RBI to infuse money through targeted long term repo operations what was observed that LTRO investments mostly occurred in large corporates or in public sector enterprises and this investment through ltro left out small and medium size nbfcs and financial institutions including micro financial institutions so in order to facilitate investment even in nbfcs financial institutions as well as micro financial institutions the rbi has provided a set of guidelines so as per the new investment guidelines of rbi it has been termed as ltro 2 whereby the reserve bank of india has allowed rupees 50000 crore to be invested in nbfcs as well as micro financial institutions and accordingly has provided a set of guidelines with respect to such investments in these nbfcs as well as micro financial institutions the guideline of rbi says that the funds available under ltro should be invested in investment grade bonds commercial paper as well as non convertible debentures of so the investment of rupees 50000 crore which is 50% of the total amount that is 1 lakh crore according to the rbi guidelines under ltro should go to small and mid sized nbfcs and micro financial institutions and the criteria given below is with respect to its distribution of funds so with respect to micro financial institutions it says that 10% of the 50000 crore rupees should be invested in securities as well as instruments issued by the mfis whereas 50% of 50000 crore rupees should be invested in securities or investments issued by nbfc having a asset size of rupees 500 crore or below whereas 25% of 50000 rupees should be invested in securities or investments issued by nbfcs having asset size between rupees 500 crore and 5000 crores so as for the initial announcement of rbi with respect to ltro funds most of the investments were made in large corporates and public sector entities and not much amount was invested in small nbfcs or micro financial institutions so accordingly the rbi has issued a new set of guidelines with respect to this investment of ltro funds another important aspect to be remembered is that these investments as per rbi guidelines must be made within one month of the availability of liquidity from rbi so once money is made available by the rbi then within one month of such availability of the money these investments should be made in these small and mid sized nbfcs as well as micro financial institutions 
So these are the new set of guidelines with respect to LTRO investments. Next, we had also discussed about ways and means advances and RBI guidelines on 2nd April 2020. Now, as a quick revision, ways and means advances are loan facility provided by the Reserve Bank of India to the central government as well as to the state governments and union territory. And this loan facility is basically for providing a facility which allows governments to meet their cash requirement. And the rate of interest under ways and means advances is the repo rate. Now, under the previous guidelines, the loan taking facility for states and union territories under ways and means advances was raised to 30%. But now, as for the new guidelines, the RBI has now decided to increase this limit of 30% to 60%. And this increment of 30 more percent from earlier guidelines of RBI will provide greater comfort to states with respect to the loan taking availability or facility from RBI under ways and means advances. And the increased limit for the states to take loan under ways and means advances shall be available till 30th of September 2020. Now the next step taken by RBI is with respect to liquidity coverage ratio. And the RBI has decreased the liquidity coverage ratio for a month to 80%. Now let us understand this concept of liquidity coverage ratio. So after the financial crisis of 2008, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision introduced this new concept of LCR or liquidity coverage ratio. And this concept of LCR is basically designed to ensure that banks hold a sufficient reserve of high quality liquid assets. As holding sufficient reserve of high quality liquid assets allows a bank to survive liquidity stress for a period of 30 calendar days in a month. So in this regard, as per the LCR requirement, banks must have high quality liquid assets. And these high quality liquid assets are cash or assets which can be converted into cash very quickly through sales with no significant loss of value. So basically either cash or any asset which can be converted very quickly into cash. So such assets are termed as high quality liquid assets. Now let us understand this concept of maintaining liquidity coverage ratio through an example. Now as we have discussed that it is important to maintain high quality liquid asset for a period of 30 days or any amount of days in a calendar month. So suppose HDFC bank on 1st of April has a cash inflow of rupees 1000 and a cash outflow of rupees 1500. So the balance of cash outflow and cash inflow remains to be rupees 500. So for the entire period of the month of April that is from 1st April to 30th April 2020 HDFC needs to maintain rupees 500 at all time during the month of April and this is what is referred as liquidity coverage ratio for the month of April. So now the RBI as per the latest decision has decided to reduce the LCR requirement to 80%. So as per the latest announcement of RBI in order to ease the liquidity position of banks the LCR requirement for scheduled commercial banks are brought down from the present 100% to 80%. So as per this example Earlier the HDFC had to maintain rupees 500 as LCR but now after the RBI move it has only to maintain 80% of the amount of its LCRs. So now HDFC has to maintain rupees 400 as part of liquidity coverage ratio as per the latest RBI move. In this regard the news highlights that this requirement of reduced LCR shall be gradually restored into two phases. So the first phase would be that the LCR requirement would be brought down to 90% by 1st of October 2020 and in the second phase it will be brought back to 100% by April 1st 2021. So this is what has been the relaxation with respect to liquidity coverage ratio as per the new RBI guidelines. Now moving on to other decisions of RBI, the Reserve Bank has further reduced the reverse repo rate by 0.25 basis points and as of now the reverse repo rate has been further reduced to 3.75% and it is done mainly so that banks do not park their funds with the RBI and rather these funds are distributed in the market in terms of loans. Now this decision of RBI to reduce reverse repo rate further will further increase liquidity in the market. Now another move of RBI is with respect to all India financial institutions. Now all India financial institutions such as NABARD, SIDBI as well as National Housing Bank 
plays an important role in order to maintain long term funding requirements however these institutions were facing certain challenges in order to raise money from the market so in this regard the reserve bank has decided to provide loans around rupees 50000 crore to nabard sidb and national housing bank to enable them to meet sectoral credit needs so this money provided by rbi will help these institutions to meet their sectoral credit requirements now of the 50000 crore 25000 crore has been allotted to nabard and this is done for refinancing regional rural banks cooperative banks as well as micro financial institutions so the fund provided to nabard that is 25000 crore will be helped to refinance regional rural banks cooperative banks as well as micro financial institutions further 15000 crore has been allotted to sidb for on lending and refinancing purposes and lastly 10000 crore has been provided to national housing bank to support housing finance companies so these are the help provided to these institutions by the reserve bank of india in form of loans and lastly rbi has also clarified certain confusion with respect to moratorium of 3 months as was allowed by rbi with respect to interest payments now rbi earlier had allowed deferment of interest payments for a period of 3 months and these 3 months that is the so called moratorium period extended from 1st march 2020 to 31st may 2020 so it was decided by the reserve bank that if any individual or institution or company does not pay their installment during these 3 months then such non payment of installment shall not be categorized as npa however there were still certain confusions with respect to those individual or companies who had defaulted earlier on their loans before this period of 1st march 2020 now another important aspect to be remembered here is that the delay of paying installments for more than 30 days that is more than 1 month is categorized as special mention accounts so if any individual or company does not pay their installment for more than 30 days then their loan is categorized as special mentioned accounts so the whole problem or the whole confusion was that that those people or institutions who had defaulted on their loans before 1st march 2020 where their loans supposed to be categorized as special mention accounts and where these accounts could be categorized as npas so accordingly the reserve bank of india has cleared this confusion that while calculating non performing assets moratorium period for 3 months shall not be counted now let's understand this through an example suppose if a company has defaulted on 1st february 2020 that is it has not paid its installments on 1st of february 2020 so you can see that this date of 1st february 2020 is prior to the moratorium period now since this company has defaulted on 1st february 2020 so generally the 90 day period for non performing assets includes 29 days of february 31 days of march and 30 days of april now as per the latest rbi notification banks should be required to exclude the period of moratorium that is this period of march and april shall not be included while calculating the npa for this company who had defaulted in february 2020 so it highlights that the bank would be required to exclude the period of moratorium that is 31 days of march and 30 days in april for the classification of loan as npa so it highlights that if the company continues to default then the bank would be required to categorize this loan as npa on 31st july as it will include 29 days in february 30 days in june which is after the moratorium period of may and 31 days in july so basically while calculating the npa for this company who had defaulted in february the moratorium period of march and april shall not be counted so this is as per the latest guidelines of reserve bank of india so all the steps taken by reserve bank of india in order to ease liquidity in the market becomes important from a prelims perspective not only the news which we have discussed today becomes important but also news discussed on 28th march 2020 and 2nd april 2020 with respect to ways and means advances becomes very important from your prelims perspective so these different guidelines with respect to different sectors becomes important for a prelims perspective and this topic gets covered under economy for your prelims examination and in your mains gets covered under gs paper 3 with this let's move on to our next news discussion
The next news to be discussed appears in the editorial section on page number 6. It says, a season of change. It is time for the meteorological department to incorporate lessons from the new norm. Now this news highlights that the meteorological department has said that India will receive normal rainfall as per its long period average. And the present long period average or the normal rainfall which India will receive this year would be 88 cm having a 5% of error margin. Now long term period average of rainfall is described or defined as average rainfall between June to September period across the country for 50 year period or for 50 year duration. Now this long period average has been changed from the earlier 89 centimeter to the present 88 centimeter that is one centimeter of rainfall has been reduced as per the present calculation of long period average. Now this is because the period which has been taken for calculation of average rainfall every year for the last 50 years has been shifted. It was earlier from 1951 to 2000 and has now been shifted from 1961 to 2010. Now what has happened so far is that this period that is from 1961 to 2010 has accounted or seen various droughts in many years such as a drought of 2002, 2004 and 2009. Now in 2004 and 2009 respectively, these droughts saw a deficit of rainfall close to 19 to 20%. So because of these, the present LPA has been reduced from the earlier 89cm to the present of 88cm. So it is in this regard the Indian Meteorological Department has announced that the monsoon this year would be likely be normal. And normal here means India will get 100% of its long period average with a potential 5% error margin. So with respect to calculation of average rainfall for India, this editorial has criticized IMD's way of forecasting of rainfall in India. So in this regard, let us go through how the Indian Meteorological Department forecasts the rainfall for the, for the Indian subcontinent. It highlights that the agency follows a two-stage forecast system. The first forecast is done in April and the second one is done in the month of June. Now it's important to understand that by the time of June in most parts of the country, the situation with respect to monsoon is quite clear. So it is comparatively easier to predict for monsoon after the month of June. However, it is with respect to the April forecast where the IMD generally falters as there are no early signs with respect to the monsoon in India. So with respect to the April forecast, the IMD tells if there are chances of drought or any other anomaly. Now what had happened in 2019 was that it was expected that less rainfall would occur and IMD was also not very sure about it. However, it was witnessed that rainfall received in the year 2019 was highest in the last 25 years. So it is on this account that the forecasting model of Indian Meteorological Department has been criticized at times. So the question is that has IMD made any changes with respect to its models? So this news says that it has made two key changes with respect to its model this year. First is the fact that it has reduced the definition of normal rainfall by 1 cm to 88 cm which we have already seen. And the second is that it has updated the monsoon onset and arrival dates for many states. Now these changes have been done in the model of IMD recognizing the changing weather pattern of the world including India. So just like any other weather phenomena monsoon has been deeply impacted by climate change. So IMD want to ensure that its model incorporates all the climate change which has been witnessing over the past few years. So in this regard it highlights that for example the monsoon is arriving later in many places having long week spells and is staying for longer periods. So this is some of the changes which we have witnessed in our weather pattern over the last few years and these patterns are being incorporated in the model adopted by the Indian Meteorological Department. Now it's important to note that the Indian Meteorological Department functions under the Ministry of Earth Sciences. So after our discussion, let's go through a question asked by UPSC in the prelims of 2014. The question was fairly simple, however very conceptual. The question was, the seasonal reversal of winds is the typical characteristic of options where equatorial climate, Mediterranean climate, monsoon climate, all of the above. Now let us also go through one of the paragraph of NCERT. It says that the climate of India is strongly influenced by monsoon winds. The sailors who came to India in historic times were one of the first to have noticed the phenomena of monsoon. They benefited from the reversal of the wind system as they came by sailing ships at the mercy of the winds. The Arabs who had also come to India as traders 
name this seasonal reversal of the wind system as monsoon so here the correct answer is monsoon climate as it refers to the seasonal reversal of winds so such type of conceptual questions at times are also asked by upsc so in this regard you should know about the basics of monsoon system and also about the long period average that as per the long period average it has been reduced from 89 cm to 88 cm and the 50 years for calculation of lpa is from 1961 to 2010 so these aspect becomes important from your prelims perspective with respect to indian geography as well as environment now the next news to be discussed appears on page number 1 it says minor forest produced in exemption list so this news highlights that as per the orders of ministry of home affairs the following activities have been exempted from restrictions which have been imposed due to spread of covid-19 virus so let us go through the exempted activities as per the order of ministry of home affairs first is with respect to collection harvesting and processing of minor forest produce non timber forest produce by scheduled tribes and other forest dwellers in forest areas the second is with respect to bamboo coconut areca nut cocoa spices plantations and their harvesting processing packaging sale and marketing now a question based on areca nut was asked in the year 2018 the question was consider the following One areca nut, two barley, third coffee, fourth finger millet, fifth ground nut, sixth sesame, and seventh turmeric. Question was: The Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs has announced the minimum support price for which of the following? In this, there were various options provided. Here, the correct answer was B. That is two, four, five, and six only. That is barley, finger millet, ground nut, as well as sesame. Now, as you can see, the official answer key of the UPSC is also provided as B. Its answer. So here, the correct answer is barley, finger millet, ground nut, as well as sesame. And in this regard, areca nut, coffee, as well as turmeric were not part of minimum support price announced by Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. Now, other activities which have been exempted are non-banking financial institution, that is NBFCs, including housing finance companies and micro finance companies. with bare minimum staff cooperative credit societies as well as construction activities in rural areas to include water supply as well as sanitation laying of power transmission lines and laying of telecom optical fiber and cable along with related activities now the term minor forest produce has been defined under the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers recognition of forest rights act of 2006 so as per the definition minor forest produce includes all non timber forest produce of plant origin including bamboo brushwood stumps cane tussar cocoons honey wax lac tendu or kendu leaves further it also includes medicinal plants and herbs roots tubers and the like so in this regard this act defines that forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers on all forest lands have the right of ownership access to collect use as well as dispose of minor forest produce which have been traditionally collected within or outside village boundaries so minor forest produce is an essential aspect of life of traditional forest dwellers including scheduled tribes as well as other traditional forest dwellers now in this aspect let us also go through the importance of minor forest produce so these minor forest produce provides both subsistence as well as cash income to such people who live nearby the forest areas including tribal people as well as members of scheduled tribe so the minor forest produce form a major portion of their food fruits medicines as well as other consumption items and these also provides cash income to these forest communities through sale so in this regard minor forest produce is a major source of livelihood for these tribals who belong to the poorest of the poor section of the society and in this aspect the minor forest produce has significant economic as well as social value for these forest dwellers including scheduled tribes so around 100 million forest dwellers depend on these minor forest producers for their food shelter medicines as well as cash income so in this regard the minor forest produce is an important part of their life with respect to their food procurement shelter medicines as well as income facility and it also provide critical subsistence during the lean seasons particularly for 
primitive tribal groups such as hunter gatherers and the landless so in this regard we understand that minor forest produce is an important aspect for traditional forest dwellers as well as scheduled tribes who depend on these minor forest produce another important point to be noted is that the minor forest produce has been defined under the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers recognition of forest rights act of 2006 so these activities has been exempted by the ministry of home affairs now the next news to be discussed appears as a lead article on page number 6 it says a virus social democracy and dividends for kerala the state has managed the crisis by building on legacies of egalitarianism social rights and public trust now basically this article highlights the benefits of social democracy as has been done by the state government of kerala so it is in this aspect the author in this article has tried to highlight the benefits of social democracy particularly with respect to the steps taken by the government of Kerala to fight the COVID-19 virus. However, in this reference, let us understand first of all the benefits of social democracy and also how according to the author, it has helped the state government of Kerala to fight the COVID-19 virus. Now, this concept of social democracy forms part of GS paper 2, specifically with respect to Indian constitutions, its features, as well as functions and responsibilities of union, as well as the states. It also gets covered under government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and also development processes and the development industry as well as role of NGOs and SHGs. Also, it gets covered under welfare schemes for vulnerable sections of the population by centre and states and also issues relating to development as well as management of health and also issues relating to poverty and hunger. As we have witnessed that various state governments as well as district authorities have tried to provide free meal to such people who cannot afford it. So in this aspect, let us go through the viewpoints of this author as per this article. Now before going through the viewpoints of the author, we should also know that the preamble to the Indian constitution not only provide for a socialist state, but also provide for economic justice. And this has been described under article 39 of the Indian constitution with respect to directive principles of state policy. So the moment we talk about the term social democracy, we basically mean about a welfare state whereby state takes care of its citizens with respect to its various needs. Further, it is in this regard that Article 38 of the Indian Constitution, also one of the part of directive principles of state policy, it has provided for a welfare state. So it is in this regard that the author has mentioned about the benefits of social democracy. So let's go through the viewpoint of the author, keeping in mind the various aspects of social democracy already highlighted in the Constitution of India, specifically with respect to preamble of the Constitution and also certain important articles with respect to the directive principles of state policy, primarily Article 38 as well as Article 39. Thus, this article highlights that there are certain comparative advantages even while fighting the COVID-19 pandemic while following the concept of social democracy. And so far, Kerala has followed this principle of social democracy as has been highlighted in this article. It says that social democracies are built on an encompassing social pact with a political commitment to provide basic welfare and broad-based opportunity to all citizens. So this is one of the primary aspect of a social democracy whereby it is a part of political commitment on part of political parties to provide basic welfare and broad based opportunity to all its citizens. In this regard it says that social democracy nurtures not only strong sense of social citizenship but can also strengthen legal as well as institutional capacities of state authorities and strengthening of legal as well as institutional capacities of state helps the state to take rightful decisions for the society without any discrimination. Further, it mentions that social democracy thrives on rights-based welfare approach. And this rights-based welfare approach has in turn also reinforced a vibrant organized civil society which demands continuous accountability from frontline state actors. So this highlights that social democracy thrives on right-based welfare approach. And because of this, the organized civil society demands continuous accountability from the state actors or from the state institutions. And since the state follows right-based welfare approach, it also becomes easier for state to provide accountability with respect to its actions. So a state following a right-based approach 
has the capability to expand its net of protection with respect to education, food, as well as public health care system. And it is in this regard, the author highlights that this right-based approach has also been followed by the state of Kerala, whereby its safety net has been extended to the area of education, food, as well as public health care system. So overall, the article says that a state practicing social democracy has wide as well as deep institutional presence and this institutional presence at all level helps the citizens of the state as citizens can rely on public institutions for delivery of important public services. So these can be said to be some of the benefits with respect to social democracy. So it is in this regard that the article has mentioned about various steps which have been taken by the government of Kerala where every aspect of social democracy has been utilized. It says that the state of Kerala was able to leverage a broad and dense health care system and this maintained a robust public presence despite presence of various private hospitals. So this highlights the public health care system in the state of Kerala. Further, in this regard, the article says that the state government of Kerala also activated an already mobilized civil society and these members from civil society acted as volunteers who went from door to door and identified such people who were at risk of COVID-19 virus and also found out such people who were in need of any public health care system or those who required immediate medical attention. Further, the article has also mentioned about an important role played by Kudum Shri of the state government of Kerala. Now, Kudum Shri is the Poverty Eradication and Women Empowerment Program of the state of Kerala and it is implemented by State Poverty Eradication Mission of the Government of Kerala. So, in this regard, even members of Kudum Shri were activated to help people fighting the COVID-19 virus. Further, important role was played by the local governments at the level of panchayats as well as municipalities. Further, these local governments were also held by members of civil society as both the members of local government along with civil society not only helped identification of hotspots but also tracked down those who were exposed to the COVID-19 virus. Further, both the local governments along with the members of civil society helped to distribute to migrant workers, elderly and differently able direct benefit transfers. Thus, this article says that Kerala government truly followed the model of social democracy and it has tried to fight the COVID-19 virus by using or by leveraging the important aspects of social democracy. So, this article primarily becomes important from your mains perspective. Now the next news also appears in the article section in page number 6. It says institutional fixes and the need for ethical politics. Now this article is with respect to anti-defection law. It highlights that it is important to examine whether the anti-defection law fulfills any purpose. This law raises fundamental concerns regarding role of legislature in parliamentary democracy. It denies legislature to right to take a principled position on a policy matter and reduces her to a involuntary supporter of the whims of party bosses. Now these aspects with respect to anti-defection law has already been discussed in detail on 20th March 2020. In this analysis, we not only discussed about a recommendation of Supreme Court with respect to a permanent tribunal deciding cases of anti-defection, but also a guidance to the Speaker of Lok Sabha and state legislative assemblies to follow principles of natural justice. Because the Speaker of Lok Sabha as well as state legislative assemblies are part of the House of the People as well as State Legislative Assembly respectively. So to understand about anti-defection law, you can go through the DNS dated 20th March 2020. Now after our discussion, this form your question for the day. The question is, consider the following statements about Kudum Shri. Option 1. Kudum Shri is the Poverty Eradication and Women Empowerment Program implemented by the State Poverty Eradication Mission of the Government of Kerala. Statement 2. Formation of Kudum Shri has helped in devolution of power at local level. Question is, which of the statements given above is are correct? Options are 1 only, 2 only, both 1 and 2 and neither 1 nor 2. Now with respect to the question of yesterday, the answer is 3 and 4. 